Hello, everybody. I'm so glad to be here. Um, I'm Nick Platt, and I am Adam Platt's dad. <laughs> and there is no way of introducing myself that gives me more pleasure. When I'm in New York, I say that. When I'm in L.A., I say I'm Oliver Platt's dad. <laughs> and Oliver's here. Stand up and take a bow. And there's another Nick Platt who maybe may not be here, but who is, uh, in his way, extraordinarily gifted, and I'm proud of him, too. I, uh, Yoshi, can we make, can you do your clicker? Show me how it works. <laughs> um, I really like this book. And I'll tell you the, the reason. Oh. Oh, yes. Okay. The, re <laughs> the reason I like this book is because Adam has made it into a family memoir to begin with. The first chapters are all eating with my father, eating with my mother, eating with my brothers, eating with my family. And he in very skillfully weaves in his gustatory experiences with those early days. But the chapters represent, I think, a wonderful family memoir. And I'm very happy about that. But this book is a lot more than just that. This book is a serious, a serious way of describing <laughs> what's happened to food writing and what's happened to food in the 20 years since you started doing all this. This is true. And in this picture, you see Adam. Um, Adam is being shown or given or regarding with reverence yeah. a piece of toast <laughs> with a tomato on it and a lot of mayonnaise. <laughs> and, and you can see from the look on his face that he's going to be a food critic. <laughs> Really, I really do look like a choir boy. Look at my bowl next, haircut. We're, we're, no, Yoshi, where's the next one? Well, you have to sit. What? Hold on. <laughs> but hang on. You gotta. You want to go back? Well, I don't know. You want to say where was that? Like where was that? What was yeah, happening? No, 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 no. No. This no. is just er, just early days. Move on. First experiences. <laughs> now, Adam has always been a critical person. Uh, I think you, you, I, give, you can give your assessment of this picture, and I'll give mine. So, right. you, so you go ahead. He was a sickly child, and he—that's <laughs> what we hear. Well, so tell him what actually what that. I'm going to tell. Them. Okay, fine. It was a sickly child, and and we we thought we might even lose him, and he came back from the hospital, having been there and had pneumonia and so forth. And um, I was taking care of him when the representative from Dighty Wash came around. And Dighty Wash wanted to take a picture of Adam, and they wanted this to be a picture that they could use for advertisements and things like well, that. And what was the, di you tell them what Dighty Wash was. It was a Dighty service. It was a diaper washing di service. Di di <laughs> diaper washing service. Of which service. the kind, they don't exist anymore. But and this was the very best. And they took pictures of people. This was the very best that, that Adam could do. They wanted the baby. <laughs> they wanted the babies to look cute and yeah. smile. And all he could do was look somewhat grumpy. <laughs> and his mom, mother, the mother Platt was gone, and so it was just me and him. And I was like, I was saying, Adam, smile, Adam, Adam. <laughs> no, thank you. Sorry, that was the best he could do. But in any case. It sets him forth as a person with certain critical facilities. <laughs> Fast forward to now, and you see the food critic in full bloom. And there really isn't that much difference between the two. <laughs> but can I, can I interject a little bit? Yes, you may. So this, this picture on the left is pretty much your favorite picture that's ever t been taken of me. Sort of, right? It is iconic. It's totally iconic. With, among him and Pod, my, my mother, there was like, this was Adam's picture. Because I, 
did have a certain skeptical quality, I think, from the womb. And I was sort of, I had, had my difficulties. I was quite sickly. I had asthma and all sorts of complaints. If you look at my mother's uh, very good, uh, she wrote these wonderful uh, notebooks. And in the early time, I used to think I was like the eldest child, perfect in every way. And you actually look, you read her uh, accounts of certainly me in Hong Kong. And I, I was, you know, she wasn't, you know, she wasn't always wildly excited with what I was doing. You know? <laughs> and she saved my report cards. I have report cards from a uh, 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 one of the many schools we went to, this one was called Glen Ely School. Remember Glen Ely in uh, Hong Kong? And it's literally C, 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 C. <laughs> and so I give her credit for, uh, for saving that. Anyway, so when that cover came out, you guys were very excited. And they dug this picture up and said, listen, this guy hasn't changed. We've had no control from the beginning. <laughs> Isn't it funny? <laughs> And so that's my uh, little, uh, that's how I see that. Uh, anyway, carry on. Yeah. Well, I, I, um, I was a uh, volunteer at an Orthodox Jewish boys club in London, and I learned a couple of, a couple of verbs in Yiddish. And one was kvel, which is to boast essentially about your children. So I spend a lot of time quelling. And the other was kvetch, <laughs> which is what Adam does a lot. Uh, whether, you know. he's, whether he's eating something or whatever, he quetches. And so I quell, he quetches, <laughs> and here we are tonight right. in New York. Adam, I wanted to ask you a bunch, bunch of questions. God, at last, a question. And, um, <laughs> First of all, um, how did your relationship with New York Magazine begin? Who? Oh. Hmm. Uh, well, I was, um, as you know, I mean, I am um, the child of the Foreign Service. Um, you grow up um, uh, living this very interesting life and very sort of uh, seeing lots of things and traveling the world, but you also grow up sort of at a distance from things. And I, there's a lot of, we have a lot of uh, mutual friends whose kids also went into journalism. So I think from a very young age, I wanted to go into journalism. I wanted to be a magazine journalist, and I had a variety of different jobs. I think I say in the book, I was, uh, uh, I wrote a column for the New York Observer about myself. I was a travel writer uh, for kind of as traveler. I had a contract to do that. I was an obituary. I wrote obituaries of the Boston Globe very early in my career. I had a bunch of failed jobs as a sort of foreign affairs writer. There were many different styles of writing. And I was, um, came to New York. Uh, I was a, one of the things I did is I had a contract to work for the New Yorker as a talk to the town writer, which ended. And then I started freelancing. And an, an editor of mine who I'd worked for was, the, was an editor at New York. And um, uh, New York has a very at that point, a very grand uh, restaurant critic named Gail Green. I don't know if you, you're familiar with Gail. <laughs> anyway, Gail announced in her grand way that she was retiring, and they, were trying to, they, they wanted to fill that job with somebody. And my editor had seen that I wrote a lot about food, right? Because thanks to you and thanks to our parapetic childhood, food was always something that, I mean, A, we had big appetites. We had three large brothers, voracious appetites. But also, I think you instilled in us from an early age, and my father, in case you didn't know, is a, is a New Yorker, born in New York, raised in New York, just like my mother. And so he grew up in the, the great restaurant culture of the city, right? And his family would love restaurants and would go to restaurants, would become regulars at restaurants and would celebrate being regulars. And so whenever we traveled around, we would try and find a restaurant, right? Which we would become regulars at somewhat, you know, uh, in the book, I described this Mongolian barbecue that we used to go to in Taichung when you were studying Mandarin. Hong Kong, we had a bunch of places we went on and on. We had a favorite sushi place in Tokyo, correct? Anyway, so food was something that I would use in my writing and also something that I would use as a way to try and connect to the world around me. And so it would pop up. And so she thought maybe, you know, wait, you know, let's try and make him a restaurant critic. And so that's, that was it. It was really out of the blue. It was not something that I aspired to. But it turned out to be a combination of all of the different writing styles that I had attempted or been good at. And being in New York, it also turned out to be really sort of this 
you know, I could, you could see the world, but would, you know, and you could stay in one place. And so, right. and so you could write sort of an essay and sort of a service piece about what to eat, and you could ruminate on different cultures and different styles of dining, but you didn't have to go anywhere. So it, was sort of, it, it, it turned out to be the sort of ideal job for me. Well, as his parents, we watched very carefully as he, as he wrote things. And uh, we could tell one that he could write, and we knew that he could eat. <laughs> and so somehow this marriage came together in, in, a, in a way that, that I think has benefited New York. Yeah. Um, he went to Columbia Journalism School, and I was very impressed with, the, with their approach. Their approach was to dip these students into each kind of writing, whether it was for books or for uh, for for day-to-day reports uh, or for magazine writing and so on and so forth. And <laughs> where Adam shone, and they said, this guy is maybe one of the best magazine writers that we have graduated. I don't that, recall that, but... I know. You, I'll you, take that. But, but you can take it. I don't recall, but yeah. So... So, so here we are, here and we are. Um, I think I want you to tell me what caused the great upheaval in food criticism and, and in the way people regarded food. You've been doing this for 20 years, and that has seen the Internet come into its own, that's seen all kinds of technological changes, but all kinds of taste, t- changes in taste. Can you sort of run through that, describe it for us? It's very, it's the heart of your book. This is true. So, yeah. So um, when I started writing about food, um, uh, the, the food world, they're probably classic, what used to be called foodies among, among you. Uh, that, 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 that phrase is going out of vogue somewhat. But when I started writing about food, especially in New York, uh, the food world was, uh, especially the people who wrote about the food world, was this sort of slightly curious, self-regarding group of people off to the side of the culture, really. They were obsessed with their own little things. You know, they are obsessed with a certain way of doing things. They are very obsessed with continental cuisine, French cuisine, um, and they are very obsessed with each other, right? And it was uh, the fancy restaurants in New York are the ones that were regarded as the destination restaurants, tended to be a certain kind of restaurant, very similar, but mostly French. Uh, mostly commanded by these domineering Frenchmen uh, who would occasionally come from France to visit New York, like uh, I think I dis- as I describe them in the book as uh, a, a, a series of visiting popes, and they were greeted, <laughs> they were greeted as such, it was all very formal. And the fancy restaurants in New York and elsewhere um, tended to be set up like stage sets in the same way. So you had the kitchen, right? You had the kitchen, which was not, not to be seen, except when the chef made his way out among his supplicants just to buy, you know, just to, you know, like a magician or, a, again, like, a, and to say hello and then go back in. And, and the, the rooms were patrolled by these, uh, do, you know, uh, in front of the house, uh, owners, maitre d's, um, uh, Sirio Maccioni, who was a famous maitre d' at Le Cirque for many years, um, even Danny Meyer, um, it, uh, who, who sort of succeeded him as the great uh, hospitality host of the, of the New York restaurant world. Anyway, so, and life proceeded. The dining rooms were these sort of stage sets where these guys controlled everything and very much uh, orchestrated what people would eat. It's a certain kind of cuisine. Danny was actually more, more casual, but more Italian-based. Syria was Italian. In that generation of diners, really your generation, um, grew up taking their cues in this way, right? I mean, you, we were different because we traveled around the world, but most, most New Yorkers, even New Yorkers and most people in America, uh, the, the post-war world was a, uh, not really a vibrant food scene. Casseroles, TV dinners. TV and dinners, yeah. Fancy, the, fancy, the, fancy, the fancy meals were uh, really d- dictated by this crowd, and that generation was happy to do it. And... In the early aughts, early 2000s, this all began to change, and the kitchen uh, really exploded from its, uh, its its little jail in the back of the house out into the 
first of all, out of the dining room, literally you saw restaurants with, with, with kitchens in the middle of them, right, as a stage. And then out into the culture at large, the whole chef's, chef's culture exploded. Uh, people like David Chang, Tony Bourdain, led this uh, sort of, it really was a revolution. Um, and it was fueled like lots of revolutions in the culture. Populist. Uh, it was fueled by the internet, by populist, by a new generation that was less interested in sort of taking their cues from the elders and more interested in curating their own experience, which is what the internet allows you to do. It's what the digital, digital culture allows you to do. And the new restaurants were, 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 were like that. And so you had less of the five star fancy places and more, a much more eclectic, uh, much more vibrant, much more chaotic uh, restaurant world, which we still have today. So how did you survive? I don't know. <laughs> well, I know. I mean, I, I, I barely mean, barely survived. You, you, you wrote a, a, a measured piece in uh, New York Magazine every every yeah. week and well, then every two weeks. Yeah. Uh, my, yeah. But but then suddenly that the was that yeah. was obsolete. So yeah. So there. And all, when I started, there were sort of two def, two basic kinds of food writers. Not that this is that all that interesting to the non. But there were two basic kinds of food writers. Uh, there were the writers who, who focused on the plate quite obsessively. Uh, Craig Claiborne, who was a great critic for the Times, obsessively focused on the plate. <coughs> Julia Childs, what she wrote, wrote about the re recipes. Uh, James Beard, same. What's on the plate? And that was a, a, a grand tradition in food writing, obviously. It still continues to this day. And then you had this group of characters, uh, mostly men, mostly paunchy, mostly middle-aged, who were not cooks, uh, but who were writers primarily who loved to eat. And what they did was they recreated the experience of dining and the re experience of eating. Uh, if you guys, you know, well, Calvin Trillin's obviously one. Uh, great writer from New Yorker, uh, A.J. Liebling, um, Joseph Weschberg wrote about, a lot about food. They you know, wrote about, you know. A Apple, too. Johnny Apple was, R.W. Yeah. Apple, famous, famous for his huge expense account and famous for just traveling the, the world recreating these dining experiences. So they were sort of the experiential school. And like I figured, like I didn't, wasn't a food, I'm not, as you probably know, I'm not a cook. I'm much more of a consumer, like my brothers, and he, like you. You can cook. Like you. No, I, I can follow a recipe, but I'm not a cook. And so I figured I had to, I mean, I was really hired as a writer, so I, I, I thought my, my idea was to try and uh, be a junior member of this experiential school and try and recreate my experience, because that's what you do in a review. You have to you have to recreate what was going on with the restaurant, or if you're writing a film review, same thing, and you have to tell people how to spend their money. And so I, that was my idea. And then the internet came along, obviously, and the whole metabolism uh, speeded up. And uh, you know, the old, olden days critics like Claiborne and Ruth Reichel uh, were like these, I use this metaphor, I, I love metaphors, and I, perhaps too much, and I use this metaphor in the book of they were, you know, they used to be like miners uh, finding these, uh, you know, with their helmets, shining lights on these delicious dishes that they found wherever the hell they went or wherever they, and then they would collect them and write about them. And maybe, you know, a month, two months, even half a year later, they, it would, they'd introduce it to the world at large to be slowly digested and then replicated. And with, then when the digital culture came along, that went away, and you had this, everything, everybody knew everything, everything immediately. So the role of the critic changed from one of a discoverer, uh, you know, they all actually, just like, like most journalists, they discovered the same, they traveled in packs and had to discover the same things at once, to, uh, you know, you just have to, you had to run around and sort of figure out uh, which way the, 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 the wind was blowing and try and figure out how to, how to, how to handle that. And I think the way that most cri the critics that have survived, and restaurant, restaurants, it's a weird kind of criticism because it's very subjective. Uh, those of you who go to restaurants know that your experience in a restaurant, you know this, your experience changes uh, day to day, depending on what time you're eating, depending on what you're, where you're seated in the restaurant, depending on whether the chef's there, depending on what you like to eat. It's very subjective. Whereas a book, you know, if you're reading, a, if you're writing a book review, everybody's reading the same book. But the restaurants change all the time. But you go several times. You go several times, and you try, you're trying to, you're, you're trying to make an argument, and you're, 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 you're trying to make them, you try to make, you're trying to persuade your reader. And um, so, it, the thing that separates, and this is what we, we surviving dinosaur critics like to say, 
separates the surviving dinosaur critics from the mad, you know, yawping crowd of uh, people online with opinions is that you still have an expense account. So if you have an expense account, you are, you are untethered. You, 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 can, you have your own opinion and you can, you can you know, you, you're paying for your own food. I mean, I'm not, but the, the magazine is. So you can, you know, you're entitled to your opinion, whereas many, especially in the early days of, um, of the digital age, m many, many of the online, a lot, lot of people were being, you know, being manipulated by the press. Anyway, so I think the new role of us dinosaurs, and Pete Wells at the Times has perfected this, is that you come along afterwards. Like you let the chaos reign for a while, and you let the, the minions run around, <laughs> make noise, and then you come afterwards and you make your lofty pronouncement. Well, I was. He well, does that. I don't really do that. But that's that's his. So the whole role, everything flip flopped, and uh, the whole uh, well, everything flip flopped everywhere. But it, it still also happened in restaurant criticism and, and in and in and in journals. Those of us who were trying to keep track of what Adam was writing would have to wait for the magazine to come out, and then there would be his sort of Gail Green-type uh, review, very careful, very measured, and so on and so forth. Correct. Um, it's also online immediately, though. Then the magazine came out. Then you, but, but then you, 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 you'd go to nymag.com. Yes. You'd plug in Grub Street. You'd plug in Platy Pants. And then you found out what he was writing that day. Well, yeah. And if he you were was on writing, Twitter, you'd plug in Twitter. writing all the time. Uh, and writing almost every day. Today. Sometimes yeah. outrageous things. Sometimes sure. wonderful things. Yeah. Um, sometimes wonderful, outrageous things. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, so that's how he survived. He stopped being, he kept on being one, but he turned into the other as well. Lists of things. If you, go, if you go online today, Grub Street, you'll find my li the list of the, thing, the, the 10 trends in, in, in rent dining for 2019 that I uh, heartily despise. So that's there for your enjoyment. Well, anyway, here's the code, nymag.com. No, come on. No. Grub Street, no, no, Naughty no, no, Pants. No. Okay. <laughs> now, um... <laughs> you can just go on Twitter... And platy pants, if you want to. It's okay. And Instagram, platy pants. Now, um, in your book, uh, you discuss quite frankly uh, the attitudes that the restaurants and uh, the owners and so forth have toward you. Correct. And um, I always loved this Danny Meyer um, blurb, and I'm going to read it to you, but because it's a good. It's a good introduction to this particular question. Mark Twain famously said, never pick a fight with people who buy ink by the barrel. <laughs> and so I have only this to, say, this to say. Adam Platt is as brilliant as he is disagreeable, and at least as funny as he is grumpy. Please buy the book of eating, Adventures in Professional Gluttony, so that Platt can just retire and leave us restaurateurs alone <laughs> once and for all. <laughs> anyway. I don't know if he wrote that. I think he did. Should I tell a Danny Meyer story? You can tell a Danny Meyer story, but I want oh, you carry to, on. I, yeah. I want you, I want to go into the very honest parts of your book where you say, you know, these guys didn't like me, wanted to throw me out, you know, yeah. Yeah. so on and so yeah. forth. And I think you should... Yeah. Describe that. Yep, they had different. It's um, very much part of yep, the narrative. Yep, yep. Um, restaurant tours. I mean, I, I describe in the book. Um, there's a whole. This is true in New York. It's true anywhere now. That, that there's a whole. I call it the kabuki dance that goes on between restaurant tours and chefs and the critics who are supposed to supposed to review what they what they write. And the, it, in general, especially a place like New York City, where there's a lot of money at stake, very usually. And uh, the restaurateurs who, sur who survive in this very competitive landscape have been there for a long time. Um, it's their business when they open a restaurant to know the critics, and they will know, they'll know them. And they, you know, since the 50s, they, they, they knew Claiborne, they, Ruth Reichel, who was famous for her disguises. If you talk to any restaurateur of her, her era, they say, well, yeah, we, we knew that was Ruth sitting in the corner dressed up in a elaborate. 
<laughs> that's what they'll say. And they'll, they'll say, well, you know, we, yeah, especially in the first three months of a restaurant operation, is that they, you know, they're, 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 A, they're treating everybody like, like critics. They're giving the, fine, the best cuts of meat. They're doing their best with service, et cetera. Um, and uh, and they're, if, you're, if you're a critic, they're, they're going to spot you and they're going to you know, pretend you're not there, but they're going to you know, almost achingly try to, to please you, except with certain occasions. I remember my first, I'd been on the, work, I'd been on the job a couple of weeks, and it was, I was like, didn't really know what I was doing, and there was a new French restaurant, it was an old French restaurant with a new chef. Uh, it was a restaurant called Le Perigord. Has anybody been to Le Perigord? So the, the owner of Le Perigord was a man named Georges Briguet, which was, is the classic kind of restaurateur that I was talking about. Even, even if you went for lunch, he'd have his, you know, you know, have his tuxedo on, and he'd tall, you know, rattling character with some elaborate, possibly fake accent. So I show up for lunch. I was actually having dinner. I was having lunch with, with, our, with, with, uh, with my, my mother, your, who was an expert. I figured she's an expert on this kind of, the restaurant's in Sutton Place, so like, she's going to be an expert on this kind of east side, upper east side, you know, lunacy. So, you know, she, she would help. I, that's the other thing I did. I would always take people who would help me you know, gauge what was going on. And so I arrived first, and I'm just me. I'm not, I figured I can't disguise myself because I'm just tall giant, bald giant, so they're going to, you know, they're, they're going to, they're, you know, it's not, if I describe myself, I'd be even more trouble. <laughs> so I show up, and plus I've been on the job two weeks. Nobody knows who I am. I hadn't written about food. So Brigitte meets me, gives a little bow, and he takes me to this table. It was just the two of me and Ma were eating, just a table for two, and it's this bad table by the kitchen. And everybody's running around, back and around. I was like, you know, it's this bad table. And he gives me the giant menu, and then just stands there. <laughs> While I flip through it, and I'm looking up at him. And I say, uh, I say, Monsieur, I say, and I figure, I say, you know, I say what I think a, a, a sort of a regular restaurant should say, and I say, what's good today? And he goes, you tell me you're the critic. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that, pretty yeah, much. That. So, and, and so they know who you are, and, um, and they have different ways of reacting, and especially in the olden days, uh, before the internet, before, before everything was basically in the open, uh, you know, they get upset. And uh, Keith McNally, do you guys know who Keith McNally is? Anyway, Keith McNally is a downtown restaurateur, famous uh, for his bistros, Balthazar. And he used to write, did these, I would give quite, I thought there was quite a nice review. Although any critic will tell you, you always have to say one bad thing, really, to maintain some kind of dignity. Like, you will do some raves, but there's always something. That, you're, good, you're good at faint praise. I do that. And McNally would go insane. Like, he would just go insane, and he'd write letters to my editors. And, and finally, then when the Internet came along, it was a heyday for him. And I did a, a, he, he would occasionally, his specialty was French, the French bistro style, the French bistro sort of formula. And occasionally he'd veer out and try and do an Italian restaurant. And they didn't rarely work. And this, we had this one restaurant on the Bowery. He bought this poor chef in from San Francisco, a very precise San Francisco kind of guy. And he's just overwhelmed by the New York madness. And that's what I wrote. I wrote he's overwhelmed by the New York madness. There's McNally. You know, I described McNally. And he uh, went insane. And he sent this open letter to the website Eater, which is now a big deal. But in those days, it was tiny. And a guy named Ben Leventhal, a friend of mine, ran Eater. And he called me in the morning. And I was, like, sitting there in my morning garb, which is generally, you know, a pair of sweatpants, if that. And he goes, do you have any response to McNally's letter? And I go, what letter? And he goes, well, let me send it to you. And so it was just, it was just, this, it was just this, this screed of, you know. And I, 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 he, but basically what he said, he said many, many things. But the, the phrase that he used is Adam Platt is um, um, he's a, a bold, overweight, and out of touch. <laughs> this is a long time ago. Like, I'm bolder, more overweight, and more out of touch now. <laughs> and so I, and the thing you do as a critic is you just say, you, you know, I understand the outrage. They, they are literally like artistic producers, theater producers. My brother Oliver can relate to this. Like, critics are full of crap, right? What do they do? They, 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 these overfed lunatics, they wander around, they're shooting their mouths off. We're working like dogs here. We're artists. What do they know? They're we right. Made, we made a movie called Chef. Well, that, that's the other thing. all about I don't know if you saw that. Yeah. He's a much better looking restaurant critic than me. But in, in, in the movie, and all of you see his performance, 
he has a similar moment where the chef comes and goes insane. And that is a very good movie. And it's made from the chef's perspective. It's a very much a, a, a kitchen slave movie. It's made from the kitchen's perspective. And the kitchen, the people in the kitchen tend to see this critic as this. You know, in all, in all of his movies, they literally film him from behind walking into the arena like he's a professional wrestler. Like, that's how they see it. Like, here's this big guy coming in to wreak havoc. And that's how they see you. But the reality is I don't see myself with it. Yeah, whatever. I'm just trying to do my job. Anyway, this, in, in all of his things, all of his things the, the guy comes out, the main character, and, you know, throws things, you know, squishes and yells at him. And, and that is, they don't do that to me, but that is how they often feel. And McNally, you know, let loose, and other people have done it. And I've been kicked out of restaurants. But the thing is, if you still Google Adam Platt and Keith McNally, you will find bald, overweight, and out of touch. Right, right, <laughs> right at the top. And, but Dan, the exception with Danny Meyer. And Danny Meyer, I'll just say a little quick, Danny Meyer. So Meyer is my children went to the same school. And so I would see him, he, he, he uh, I'd see him in the morning, and if you know Danny Meyer, he's always got a tie, he's a bright smile, he's so cheerful. He, he's really driving you insane, especially, especially early in the morning. It's like, Jesus Christ, <laughs> Danny. And so he, had, he did a, he's from St. Louis, and he loves barbecue, and he, did a, he, did a, he opened a barbecue joint called Blue Smoke, and I gave it a scathing tack. Review. You know, I don't know what I said. It was mean. And so I was with my kids in the morning, and here comes Danny. Like, oh no, he's coming right at me again. I'm dressed in my sweatpants, <laughs> disheveled, you know, overweight, bald, the whole thing, <laughs> tired, and he's coming right at me. He goes, <laughs> and he puts his hand out, and he goes, you know, he's smiling and smile, and he goes, at, you know, I just want to, you understand that that was a. It was a tough review, but it was a fair review, and we'll learn from it, and thank you. I was like, oh. <laughs> oh. I, did, I didn't give him a bad review for at least another decade. Well, actually. Actually, <laughs> he, was actually, he was actually telling the truth, actually. He's a, the, the, the thing is that you can't, you know, you, the rest, any, any restaurateur will tell you that the life of a restaurant, you know, reviewing a restaurant, even in the first three months, is insane. It's like, you know, the life of a restaurant, they're, they're like ships. So you, they go on these cruises and shake down cruises, and they don't really hit their stride until six months, a year out. And a good re restaurant or a confident one will take this review and will, you know, learn from it. So he said that, and good for him. Well, it's been a long time sort of family not sort of joke, it's actually quite serious, but we've always said to each other, well, you know, Adam's grown in his job. And <laughs> that was a serious concern, because if you're going out to eat Still growing. every day, all the time, um, it's going to affect the way you look and the way <laughs> you feel and so on and so forth. And Adam has successfully dealt with this over 20 years, but it's, I wanted you to tell me how you dealt with it and what your best, what your best take on a, on a diet is. Yeah. Well, so you read the book, you read the, you read, I mean, the dieting goes way back in our family, right? It's not, basically we lived the lives of restaurant critics as kids, sort of. I do say that in the book. So we were always struggling with our girth, should we say? Me and too. you too. Him, my father also, but he's a very disciplined character. And we, we grew up in a household where, on the one hand, you're, you're taking these wonderful restaurants. You're not encouraged to eat, but you're certainly, there's a lot of food around. And if you're, if you're living this peripatetic life, you're, you know, they're, you're, you're nervous. You're going to new schools. You're, you need comfort. And food was one of our great comforts. So we would, my brothers and I would eat like you know, untrammeled hogs. And we had these wonderful chefs who cooked this delicious food, and certainly in Hong Kong and Taichung. And then we had my father, who was rowing and fit and well dressed in a Danny Meyer fashion. And he, he you, and this is true, right? You would, uh, he'd been a fat kid, and he uh, conquered that. And he used to weigh himself every day and write little indentation, record the weight, and then if he was like half a pound overweight, write little, you know. Go, 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 go. Do better, exclamation. Right? Like endless notebooks went on for years. And we're like, you know, the Platt Boys, like, we didn't, 
want to weigh ourselves very much because <laughs> because it, it if it, it is I'm speaking for me uh, Oliver maybe but it's like if I do weigh myself and I'm thin er I'll start eating with, from, from joy it's like I'll joyfully go out and yeah I can eat some food and if I uh, am overweight which is usually a thing I'll get depressed and I'll eat also <laughs> so you didn't you were, know the you're, more, you're more disciplined mentally than us Still, and, I, and as I say in the book, so we'd been on diets. We went on these diets. I, mean, I would go to these fat camps even before I got this job. So it was fat camps. And then once I got the job, the fat camps and the diet gurus, I, I think I described the diet gurus will rear up out of the desert like religious prophets periodically, <laughs> like every five years. Like, here they come, and I'll follow them for like a few months, and I'll lose 50 pounds and then spend six months like happily gaining it back. So the, the answer is I'd never really figured it out. But, but there are many, if you look at the book, there are many stories of these, these, these with people and I mean, basically the whole key to dieting is not eating very much. It's very hard to do in my job. And I also talk about how, you know, it's very hard for anybody to do. Mimi, Mimi Sheridan was a great critic for the Times in the 70s and 80s, and she, you know, she still lives on all over the street. And I still see her occasionally. And she told me she's quite a straightforward, for, forthright character. And she said that after her, she was a Times critic, and the Times critic is a, that's a brutal job. You're writing every week. You, they make you go three or four times. There's huge pressure on you because whatever the Times says is the word of God. At least that's what their editors want, want them to believe. And the, people really do go, get upset with them. You know, they, they, you have this power, which is, uh, affects the writer, whoever has that job in different ways. And, uh, but anyway, she said she gained, and she's a diminutive woman, she gained 75 pounds. And she said it took five years for her to get it off. And again, she's a disciplined person, but it took five years of, you know, and she comes out with me and she goes, she just shields her eyes, like, oh my God. So well, it's a struggle. You can't eat very much. It's one of the drawbacks of, of, a, of a profession. I'm going to ask one more question, then I'm going to throw the floor open to your questions. But um, in, the, in the modern digital age, Blogs have come into have come come into their own, and Adam has um, figured out that one of the great respondents for a blog is his daughter Penelope, and his daughter Penelope and he have a dialogue going, and this is something that has given all of us a lot of ple pleasure. How did that come about, though? It uh, came about uh, not just Penelope, also Jane. Uh, my my oldest daughter, who's actually the really the, our family, the the, the 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 most refined gourmet of our family. Janie's got a very refined palate. Uh, it came about because um, I was an old writer, and my editors wanted young voices in my stories. So they're my daughter's younger. People like hearing from them, um, and so that's that's really how it came out about. And then me and Penelope made a series of videos, which nobody watched, but or, but some of them were quite amusing. And it was, again, it was the attempt of an of a old, old line media organization, old line print organization, to try and get into video, which is, as everybody, any journalist know, the, the, the rush to video, then there's the rush to podcasts. And in all of those various rushes and stampedes, uh, New York uh, was, didn't go anywhere. Um, but we made these videos about, it was basically her, the first one we made was for her, um, telling me how to take pictures of food and put it on my Instagram feed. And it's actually really cute. If you go to uh, well, these, my website, platys.com, and go to the videos, it's really quite cute. But anyway, that, yeah. It, these and, are and fun also, to watch. Oh, these are fun to watch. They're fun to watch. But also, just very qu quickly, when you're writing the same uh, column basically week after week, it's a very formulaic style, uh, you're really de just desperate to try and get some kind of different uh, life into it. And one of the ways is to, I, in the beginning I started creating characters, which is what Gail did, until my editor, Adam Moss, is very, didn't really like food that much, and he didn't really, I don't think like restaurant reviews that much. He said, he said, just, just stop the, you know, we don't need like Mr. Pork Chop, or we don't need these stupid characters. <laughs> he didn't say it, it was, it came down the chain of command, and I was like, okay. So uh, it, it, the daughters are an, an easier way of I, mean, I just wrote a review of this Japanese restaurant that specializes in the nori hand rolls. And Penelope is a, and Penelope also very persnickety. She only likes certain kinds of food. She likes ramen. She likes um, uh, pizza. She doesn't like, she's not 
she's a she's a simple eater anyway. So she she's in that. She loved it. So you know, you can click on it when it comes out. One of the things that I've always liked about your writing about food is that you try to put whatever restaurant it is and whatever you're eating into some kind of historical context. Try. And uh, most restaurant critics don't do that. So you have a feel for the history, you have a feel for the sweep of um, restaurant criticism, people's feel for food and so forth. And so therefore, I think you all should read this book. <laughs> now it's time to throw the questions open to you. Please take the, where, where, Yoshi, you, you've got the, he's you've leaving. got the mic. Who, he's who, had, he's like had the, enough. Who, so who, who do you want? There's right, right behind you. Yeah. I only read the excerpt so far. I loved it. I did love it. And I'm not interested in food, as I already told you. But I think the, uh, the way you handle the family and the relationship uh, of food to your family is, is lovely, just beautiful. I do wonder, though, and I'd love to have you um, speak to the subject of food as a problem in society, that we eat the wrong things, we eat too much, it's you know, not sustainable in terms of you know, economic inequality. I mean, all of the sort of the downside of it. And, and, and see, where is, do you think that's where food criticism will be going in the future? Well, food, you know, the, the whole food has become, along with cooking and the chef's culture and those things, it has gone from, again, there's something that stuff that people like Julia Child waved her hands about on public television, really into the center of the culture. And for the younger generation, uh, millennial, you call them whatever, whatever you wish. I call them the Starbucks generation because they grew up at Starbucks as opposed to, say, uh, frozen TV dinners or, like me, McDonald's, fast food. Starbucks is actually a very sophisticated uh, restaurant where you can ha you have a lot of control. And you, you can have your certain kind of beans and you order certain ways. And so for this generation, food is uh, not just food. It's politics. Uh, it's culture. Uh, it's the environment, obviously. And that discussion has, in a lot of ways, left old-fashioned restaurant criticism behind. And there's a new kind of restaurant criticism. And it is, you see it not just in criticism, but you see it in journalism at large, which is based more on those issues, uh, based on issues of identity, uh, based on stories of you know, where things come from, where things are going. So the answer is yeah. I mean, those 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 broader issues. It's, what, it's actually what makes food interesting. I mean, it's a much more interesting um, topic than what I thought it would be when I started writing about it. And uh, you know, old-fashioned writers like me are just continually trying to get our arms around it because it keeps expanding and expanding and expanding. Lulu. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. I just wanted to follow up on that other question. Um, and, and, and Nick talking about uh, the sweep of history as you follow the course of food. So we are all focused on the millennials and what they're doing, and they seem to be dictating so many of the, the new trends. Given, But uh, the question was addressed to a food criticism. But how about looking at the millennials, their focus on sustainability and the farm to the table? Given all these trends, do you, are you seeing new forms of culinary um, styles evolve from this? Yeah, well, this, and, the, yeah. And, and which ones do you find the most interesting and serious? Yeah, so there's thousands of different culinary styles, but the main one you mentioned, farm to table. So when these chefs broke out of the kitchen, right, uh, what you had was you had this, the, the, the things that they used to obsess about uh, in the back, or go out and eat like the perfect pork chop, or technique, or ingredients where they came from, or the perfect hamburger. These all became these these chefs' obsessions all became uh, the the culinary obsessions, and they replaced the high, more high-minded French continental, you know, souffles and uh, this more stagey kind of dining. And uh, you know the restaurant Kraft. You've been you guys been to Kraft. So Kraft was the first restaurant. It's an old restaurant now, but it opened in the early aughts, and it, it put this 
it put the, 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 this world, which has heretofore only been discussed by chefs, it raised it to the level of, sort of New York snobism and chic. And that still continues. Like the, the chefs these days, the, uh, the, 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 the chefs with international reputations are not just chefs. They're, I mean, they're, they're like, oh, I call them philosopher kings. Like if you know who Dan Barber is, he's the uh, chef at Blue Hill, and he runs the wonderful farm and table restaurant up, up the Hudson. Uh, Rene Redzepi, who was another chef in Copenhagen, they don't just talk about recipes. They talk about food and where it comes from and sustainability and foraging off the land so you don't bruise it. And they have, they, it, it, you know, it really, it's a whole different thing that chefs used to talk about. And so that's just, I think that that's going to go on and on. And there, all, all of these chefs that I'm talking about are very, David Chang's the same, very uh, facile with, with social media. And so they don't need an, uh, uh, somebody like me to translate uh, their, their vision for them. It's like, it's, it's right there for this. And again, it's not a new generation anymore. It's right there. They can get their stories out uh, willy-nilly. And so that's not, that's not going to change. It's only, food's only become more political and more cultural and more, more, more part of, as, as, as the journalists like to say, part of the conversation. Is there anything special about millennials, though? No, not really. <laughs> no, yeah, whatever. They're young. Yeah, they're, they, they, they've got money in their pocket. In the back, in the very back. In the very back. Thank you for your scorn toward, towards our generation. Um, <laughs> I've been a fan for a long time. I appreciate your writing. Um, we do have a divide in this city. That is Manhattan versus Brooklyn. Yep. <laughs> Can you talk about your first early ventures forth and when it's worth it? Oh, God. So you look a lot like my, one of my editors. I was like, Jesus. <laughs> Noreen, what are you doing here? And she would have said that exact same thing. Thank you for scorning my generation. Uh, you know, Brooklyn, like I, I predate, but Brooklyn is more of a state of mind, really. You know, Bro Brooklyn, Brooklyn represents, it was the first uh, representation of this more casual form of not just food, sort of everything. You know, food, food was one of the things that was one of the sort of the uh, things that Brooklyners held their hats on. But I, I don't think, and I, I may be wrong, um, a lot of the stuff that was popularized in Brooklyn started in Manhattan. You know, the little t the tasting bars and uh, you know the the obsession with uh, you know the burgers or whatever. They, they, I, as an old grumpy New York Manhattan centric critic, I, I I would sort of poo poo Brooklyn. And Brooklyn is not, but Br Brooklyn. I don't mean that in a bad way. What what's happened? What's happened is that everything has become Brooklyn. Uh, you don't really have, even in New York, people are always asking, what's your favorite restaurant? And I, in the olden days, there were these destination restaurants, which are really still often the same ones that they are now. You know, La Bernadette, Danielle, you, the fancy Italian restaurants downtown. They don't, they don't really change much. Uh, and Brooklyn is not a place with a lot of destination restaurants. But it's a place where, the, as time has gone on, this, this, the, the dining culture has become deeper, deeper, broader, broader, more and more democratic, more based on uh, the neighborhood. It's its own market now. You know, many of the restaurants are somewhat the same, somewhat formulaic, because, you know, that's what the people who live there like. And it's not, you know, if you go to Paris and you want to look at the, you know, what's the trendy restaurant? I went to Paris a couple of years ago with my family. I was like, where's the trendy restaurant? All the fancy, all the grand restaurants are, are French. They're, you've seen it a hundred times before. The trendy restaurants look like Brooklyn restaurants. Sad to say, they're not. They're not really very good. <laughs> okay. I love Brooklyn. But I love. But I love. You know, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> I better stop talking about millennials. I won't talk about Brooklyn, but I won't call the millennial point either. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> it's all good with millennials. So. No. Um, so also, a um, big fan of yours. When I moved to New York, I religiously grabbed the magazine every week to read it. But um, my favorite story is your review of Carbone. Yeah. And the results that came out of that, and yeah. how Mario and Richard kicked yeah. you out the next time you dined there. Right. And then very soon thereafter, you came out on the magazine. Um, yeah. And showed your face, maybe even yeah. before. Um, I can't but really, how was that experience? And then the whole yeah. coming out and putting your face out there yeah. as I'm the restaurant critic for New York Mag. How did that decision go? Very good question. Um, first, the Carbone. Um, Carbone, if you know, uh, the, one of the trends. Uh, 
this is sort of popularized by David Chang, is, is these chefs, these younger chefs, uh, used to be that the young chefs would, the young ambitious chefs would work their way up through a, a grand kitchen, whether it's French or Italian, and get screamed at for 10, 15 years before maybe assuming the mantle of the Pope who happened to run that kitchen. And Chang and others said, oh, we're not doing that. And in Chang's case, it's like, I can't do that. I'm going to go open a restaurant in a neighborhood where it's cheaper, and I'm going to focus on the food of my youth, the, the, the stuff that I like to eat as a child or growing up, but I'm going to do it with a chef's sensibility. I'm going to make the best bowl of ramen I can, whatever, the best pork belly I can, whatever. And uh, Rich, Teresi, America Brown uh, did the same thing. They trained at wherever, uh, you know, Boulud, et cetera. And they opened um, an Italian corner deli in the style of the Jersey, New York, Queens corner deli. And it was the best ch chicken parm sandwich you ever had, you know, fresh baked bread and it's awesome. And then they became one of the ironies of the, of the new age, of the new internet age, and it's not just food, is that there's this huge hunger for information and hunger for news. But just as that happened, the old star system of the chefs faded away. So you didn't have, uh, you know, Daniel Ballou to write about it anymore. And if he did, people were tired of him. So the, 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 the digital culture is always seeking something new, almost desperately. So these guys became big stars, and they opened fancy and fancy restaurants. And Carbone was their homage to the great red sauce restaurants. And I gave it a, my, my, my philosophy, this was a journal, and most journalists grow up with this, you comfort the afflicted and you afflict the comfortable. <laughs> So if they're, the Carbone's going to be happy and proud of themselves, and like, I, I was just going to have to say something about it. You know, I don't care. I was like, so I gave them a bad, you know, one-star review. They went insane, quietly. And their next restaurant, um, and by the way, critics hate stars. Restaurant critics hate star, stars. It's a, it's a total sham. It's not, any critic will tell you quietly, and sometimes, in my case, loudly, that the star systems are ridiculous. Anyway, but people love them and love to talk about them. <laughs> Um, so they, anyway, they, they opened this pr precious little clam bar. It's called ZZ's Clam Bar. And I went there with my editor, the editor of this book, who commissioned this book, a very grand, quite grand, imposing figure. He's Anthony Bourdain's editor. He's used to being kowtowed to by the cooking world and the chefs and getting the best table. And we're eating our, you know, very self-satisfied, blah, 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 blah. Suddenly the whole place goes quiet. And there had been a bouncer outside, which is a, a bad sign. If you see a restaurant, there's a bouncer outside. <laughs> Don't go into that restaurant <laughs> or go in there with trepidation because they, they have other things. It's more of a show and a scene than, than a food place. Anyway, so this giant guy in his overcoat showed up. He goes, you're done here. And I was like, oh, okay. And they said, uh, can you explain? And I go, no, you said you're done here. He's like a bouncer. Like, uh. And my the editor proceeded to get red in the face. And, and I had to tell him, say, you know, that we're being kicked out. And that's uh, not a bad thing for me. I don't, I don't mind being kicked out. Platty pants is getting kicked out of a restaurant. And so that's what happened. So they kicked me out, and then I immediately on the, on the, out on the corner, or, you know, on the sidewalk, I said, I, you know, platty pants, whatever. It was the last thing I ate at whatever. And well, they already went insane briefly, and then they moved on to other things. And so, yeah, that's that story. And I think it's a bad, you know, it's a badge of honor if, if you're a critic. You're not doing your job, and if, if they're upset, you're not doing. If they're not upset, you're not doing your job. I, I think. And uh, you know, you have to you have to entertain your reader. You have to develop a very strong point of view, which they will come back to again and again. Even if they don't like the restaurant, they'll like what you how you describe it. Um, and you have to, you know, get people upset now and then. Uh, and the the, the 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 giant mug on the magazine that was sort of a different thing. And that was Adam Moss's idea. And Adam Moss uh, grew tired, I think, of, I used to do a big end of the year wrap up. And he grew tired of trying to sell it to advertisers who didn't care about that kind of thing anymore. And so he had this idea, he'd gone out with me and he'd seen the Kabuki dance. And he goes, Let's, we're putting you on the cover. How do you feel about that? I was like, okay. <laughs> was, I didn't really have much choice. So that was, that was his idea. One more question. Speaking of that, do you think the Times, you think the Times was unfair to Peter Lugers? No, I loved that review. <laughs> All right. That was a, that was a wonderful, that, that is what a critic should do. And, and, and uh, in, in the case of Lugers, like, they, they, reach, they reach this point, I call it, I call it various names, but they reach this point where it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how they treat people. 
doesn't matter how much they charge. Luger's is an all cash restaurant now, or you can use, buy a ridiculous U Luger's card and go there. And like uh, in the last 20 years, it's been a golden age of all different kinds of food everywhere, including in New York. And it's a golden age of steak. You know, the steak has never been better. You can get great steak at uh, uh, French restaurants, great steak at Italian restaurants. Steakhouses are great. These modern steakhouses are great. But Luger has, having basically invented this template to a certain extent, has just, you know, they don't need to change. They don't need to uh, make sure that their meat is not, uh, you know, they, they, if you go there, it's like their meat's up and down. It's like, I don't know. I, I've been there a couple of times. I've always hated it. And they treat you just through the light, it's this, this hospital light, and they're all yelling at you, and they jostle you around. He, he, would, he, would, like, he would never enjoy a, a meal I've at Luger's. I've been there. You have? I didn't like it either. No, he didn't like it. <laughs> and it's a critic's duty to point that out on occasion. And it's very smart of Pete to do that and to find this iconic. I think what happened, he was writing about, there's a Brooklyn restaurant, good one, that I like. <clears throat> It was a corner bar restaurant. That's the thing. You have to hype these corner bar. But was, and they had this, this hamburger that was uh, an homage to the famous Luger's burger that served at lunch. So he went there at lunch to see how the Luger burger was, unlike me. I reviewed the same restaurant. I didn't go to Luger's because I hate Luger's to see how the, the, the thing was. And he, I, I think he looked around. And he said, you know, this is, I'm not enjoying myself. And so then he did a review. Of it. And it was a, it's what a critic should do, really. But the interesting thing about it was the, the, the zombie Luger army that came back at it. <laughs> it's like, guys, you know, and they're, they're really in their heart. It's like Luger's is, is the sainted place, so you have to respect that, but uh, you have to also respect his opinion, and that's his job. Um, Roger. I'm also, uh, okay. It's my cousin Roger. Also, He's up to no good. <laughs> <laughs> Outed already. I wanted to do a little shtick. Never mind. No, do it. Do it. Ambassador Platt, um, <laughs> let me um, shift a little bit to you because we're at the Asia Society, and I wondered whether in reading Adam's book there was anything that particularly um, struck you about one of two subjects. One, either the, the history or change of Asian food in New York City or the, the world of Asian food in New York City, or any of the memories that it might have resonated with your travels and your experience as a diplomat, how food played in that world. Was there, was there something that the book kind of sparked for you, Ambassador Platt? Well, um, the book was, it, it, really, it really pinged me in a lot of different ways. Um, and of course, food in, in, in diplomacy is very important. Uh, you can also grow in those jobs too, and uh, you have to you have to watch watch out for that. But it's it's a uh, it's it's pro protocol is terribly important, um, and where people sit at dinner is terribly important. The French and the Chinese put their very best diplomats into protocol. We don't. But I asked the French and the Chinese why they did that, and they said, well, if you have a substance, substantive um, issue that you need to solve, you can always paper it over, you can always change the words. But if you make a mistake in protocol, you can't change that. It's there, and you got to live with it. So don't so, so watch and be careful and know the rules. Protocol is not a picky business. It's actually sensible. But uh, this is something that, that I had to deal with a lot. But I also particularly enjoyed uh, going out and eating with my children. And, um, Still does it on occasion. The book r r r r does... does does homage to that. I'll close with this. My kids have asked me, well, what do you, what, what, what's your goal in life? And my answer is, I want to be 90 years old, and I'm going to be sitting in a rocking chair with you three guys, and you've all become geezers too. <laughs> and all that we're doing is gossiping. We're gossiping about the events of the day, food, whatever, whatever. 
And all I want you to know about tonight is that this process has begun. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Well done. Drink some wine and buy some books.